Hello and welcome to Murder with Friends, the show where friends get together and talk about some of the darker sides of history. I'm your host, Grace Baldridge, and joining me today is the entire Murder with Friends team. Yes, we have Amir, Elle, and Cassie, and this is what we like to call a campfire edition. It's where we all get together and we talk about some of our favorite spooky, scary, real life stories. And kicking off this episode, we have Cassie. And Cassie, you are going to be telling us about the Girl Scout murders and I had thought that they were solved and you said right before we went to tape no not really so dig in well I'm a Girl Scout and so you are yeah oh wow gold award everything life Girl super Scout for life. I'm proud of you I was a boy scout well, I was yeah. a cub scout I never made it past cub scout we knew yeah. that I could, I could have predicted that <laughs> so when we went camping a lot and this was a story that was told to me camping so I thought it was one of those urban myths and then as I got older I just looked it up out of curiosity and realized it was true. And so this happened in the late 1970s. It was at Camp Scott in Oklahoma. Basically, two months before camp had opened, counselors were doing a training session and they found a note. One of their tents were ransacked and in the note it said that three campers would be murdered. They brushed it off as a prank because back in Oklahoma, they didn't think that was something that would happen because this was and people apparently in Oklahoma were very bad at pranking. This was the yeah. 70s, right? Yeah, this was okay, the 70s, so. so they still felt like super safe yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. So flash forward to June 13th, 1977. This was the first day of camp. A thunderstorm hits that night. Oh no. It was loud, counselors couldn't hear anything really because of the storm. Later, girls would come out and say that they heard moans and noises and stuff, but that only came out to police and not the counselors. Um, Early that morning, a camp counselor got up to go take a shower and she came across a sleeping bag and it turns out it was one of the girls. And later on, police came out and they found the other two girls' bodies in the sleeping bag. And it was Doris Milner, who was one of the girls. She died from strangulation. And then the other two was Michelle Geese and Lori Lee Farmer, who had died from beatings, is what they speculated. And they think that they all three of them had been sexually abused as well. Uh, they were all part of tent number seven, which was referred to by the Girl Scouts, though a lot of police refer to it as tent number eight because they counted the counselor's tent. And this tent seven was pretty far away from the counselors. It was the furthest away. It was kind of obstructed in view by um, this whole camp area trees. So I'm gonna cut to the video of the victim's mom describing about why she wouldn't stay in that tent. If I had known a tent had been slashed the night before Lori was to get on the bus to go, I would have never let her go. And when we got up there and saw the arrangement of the area, it um, is not the way we thought our child was going to be in a camp area. I would not have stayed in the tent Lori was in as an adult. I would not have stayed there. I would have been frightened. She wouldn't have stayed in the tent because she felt it was too far away from the rest of the tents. The mom was saying that it felt like very isolated from the rest yeah. of the camp. What the fuck? It, it was like obstructed. It was the furthest away tent. Um, I believe there was like a shower or latrine area that was kind of blocking from the view of the counselors. And why was it even put there? You're in Oklahoma camping with Girl Scouts. There's the last thing on your mind is some lunatic. Even the after somebody left on, a note. <laughs> yeah. Now, it was but a back prank. then, no. <laughs> That's but the, but the tent note. had been slashed. Yeah. With the note left in three That was like two months prior. Okay. And so uh, up in those two months, items would go missing, kind of like on and off. But, but were the parents at all informed, the parents no. of the Girl Scout troop? So they it was weren't. just the counselors that kept it to themselves? Yes. So um, there was a lawsuit with the victims Good. to the Girl Scout council about it, and they did win the lawsuit. Uh, about not being informed, but Super. they all the counselors thought it was all pranks and some of them it was like they were 18 19 years old and so they didn't they were kind of afraid to say anything because they didn't want to feel like they're a scaredy cat in a sense if I got a Huge. note that said I'm gonna Steal your lunch tomorrow. I would probably call the police. I'd be like this is Homeland weird. Security. There's something weird about it um, so when were the breaks in the case? So the, the bodies are discovered. Yeah. What happened that they were able to sort of bring someone to justice? So it gets weirder. Oh no, So, <laughs> so as you know, a lot of the items had gone missing. Um, 
When police were tracking items with their dogs and stuff, they came across a nearby cave, which had a lot of the campers' missing photos, including the ones that had died. Um, photos, uh, campers' eyeglasses, which is kind of important to know. And that cave eventually led them to Jean Laurie Hart. And Jean Laurie Hart had a history of violence, burglary. He raped two women, I think pregnant women, correct? Yeah, and kidnapping. He had escaped from prison several years before the murder, but locals helped hide him because he was a local football hero and he had deep ties to the Native American community that locals couldn't believe that he would have done something like this. Hart knew his hometown terrain and he had hundreds of relatives and friends who protected him. Because of this, Hart was able to evade authorities for 10 months. And do you think Gene Laura Hart killed those girls? No, I do not. Why not? He wasn't that kind of a guy. You just had to know him to understand. Hart may have been well-liked, but it was his racial heritage that was a major asset in winning allies. The Native American is huge. That, that factor is bigger, much bigger than the, any football uh, factor. The fact that he was a, a Cherokee and, uh, and the fact that uh, this, this area, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's very clannish. Betty Fallis was appointed special prosecutor for the case against Gene Leroy Hart. He was welcomed to Mays County with bumper stickers that read, Welcome to the heart of Gene Country. You knew where people stood as you walked in the courthouse in the morning. On one side, out on the lawn, you'd see the, the people who were very upset uh, with law enforcement, with the prosecution, uh, uh, the family, the, the Gousses or the, or the farmers uh, or Mrs. Milner and her mother coming in there. I mean, you know, they, you, you walk the gauntlet to go in there uh, of all these, because there was a big crowd, no question about it. Um, the, uh, you know, it was not, uh, it was not a very comfortable feeling. I, I can't right now. Gene country? Yeah, the heart of Gene country. Bumper because stickers. they loved him yes. so much. Yes. That's ridiculous. It gets crazier. So Don't tell me that, Cassie. Yes. Jean was found living with a medicine man, the local medicine man of the tribe, wearing women's eyeglasses. Now, it's important to note when he raped those two women earlier from his prior conventions, he was also wearing women's glasses then that he'd stolen from the women. So there was like this repetition going on from his previous stuff. And the eyeglasses that he had were camper's eyeglasses. The, that he was wearing? Yes, when he was arrested. And how did he explain yeah. that? He just kind of Whoops. didn't. Yeah, he's like, Whoops. Found him. Yeah, I mean, he never, like, admitted to it. So when it came to the jury, the jury actually ended up acquitting him. They believe that there wasn't enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Oh, fuck you. Like, really? Yeah, they're, they're still... They're, he got away because well, he was a local okay, wait, celebrity. Well, okay, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. To be fair, I am, I'm listening to this, and I think that Gene sounds like a really shady guy, and I think the community definitely rallied behind him without looking at the evidence, but all that I've heard so far, and from my baseline knowledge of the case, it, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence here. Yeah. It looks very bad for him, but it doesn't sound like there was a lot of DNA to corroborate um, this theory. So, like, some of the evidence didn't match up. They did find a bloody footprint, like, in the tent which was a size nine and Jean's size is like a size 11. So there's no way he could have like had smaller feet. Um, another thing was is that they found a fingerprints on a flashlight that they had found outside um, that did not match his fingerprints. Mm -hmm. So they did run tests on the DNA that didn't quite match. I'm gonna cut to the video of the DNA. A decade after the trial, investigators still wanted answers about Hart. They hoped a new technique called DNA testing might help. Three of the five tests run on material found at the scene matched Hart's DNA, but still, it was not enough to be conclusive. If three came back and were a match, then so far you would have a match. But if one or two of those other locations did not match, then that would turn that match into an exclusion. Because all you need is one location or one probe to differ for it to be an exclusion. Uh, if there was insufficient information on the other two, that it was inconclusive or results couldn't be obtained for the other two, then you would have, still have a match, but you may not have as uh, highly discriminating of a match as you would if you had five locations. Okay, a quick follow-up question before we get into the details of the DNA. What do we know about the crime scene? Was it contaminated? How was it discovered? How, how was the police work in this case? Because whenever we talk about muddled DNA, I always think about... Was the scene contained? 
It was contained. So when they found the first body, they immediately evacuated camp. They told the girls that there was water issues and they didn't let them know and they just got them on the buses. And they had a police escort and had them meet in a location. There was a lot of tracking dogs. So I think the police did a good job okay. on finding the stuff. Um, I think just as a time, just not having the technology up to date and with the evidence that they did have, they weren't able to get other suspects. I do believe there was more than one suspect for this case. As you said, like, three of the DNA mat did match him, but two didn't. So what and was the DNA theory pointing to? What is the what is the popular theory that people throw out with regards to this case now? That there was more than one. But that um, Gene was involved. Yeah, they do think he was involved. I mean, they tried to retest the DNA later in 2002, but the DNA was so deteriorated from the case mm -hmm. for being so old that they couldn't get any results out of it. And what's his side of this? What does he say he was doing the night of the murder? He just denied it. I mean, flat there wasn't, out. yeah, just flat out denied it, wouldn't take part. But it gets even weirder, like with the medicine man and stuff. Oh, no. it, it's just, this is like the last part, I promise. But it's weird. No, no, this, I mean, it's, <laughs> it can't I'm get enthralled. any weirder. Weird is good at murder yeah. with friends. So there's a lot of supernatural elements that kind of hit this story. Um, for one thing, there's rumors of shape shifting with him. So in the Cherokee Nation, they believe that there's something called a stagni. We, if I, I, excuse me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but it's a great medicine owl. So they believe that Gene shapeshifted into a medicine owl to escape prison, and something similar was used when he murdered the girls. Why would that exempt him of his guilt? It seems like a lot of the community was willing to sort of forgive him or overlook this, because the description of a shapeshifter sort of sounds like an explanation. Like, oh, he's not guilty, he was shapeshifting. Like, even if he was shapeshifting, you still, Oh, he's a shapeshifter. They, yeah. they kill well, people all the time. It's okay. It's a weird explanation yeah. to have thrown out there. Well, he like, they believe that's how he escaped prison. I don't think they really believed how, that's how like he murdered the girls, but there's other things that point to that he possibly used shapeshifting to murder the girls. Do go on. There was still security at the, at uh, the camp. And so the security guards would see a man in the woods and they would go after the man in the woods and they could never find him. And so that was like kind of a weird thing to investigate. And one of the times they did it, they returned after an hour of searching for it. They came back and they found in a plastic bag, uh, sealed up pink socks and shoes with Doris Milner's name inside the shoes. The sealed up left on their steps of the security building. And so after that had happened, security called police in to do tracking with the dogs to see if they could find anything up. Uh, security put up thin threads between between the trees to see if they could kind of like catch this mm -hmm. this was someone that actually existed and the next day threads would be broken. Possible it was a guy, could have been animals. You know, it's a little thing. But when the dogs were tracking the scent, they would take off with the scent and just go full blown through the woods going after this scent. And each time it left them where the, the Kiowa unit, which is where the girls were murdered in their tents and they would lose the scent there and the dogs would just keep like looking up. What? Whoa. It was as if something oh had I ascended up. Yeah, and so that, that's where like the rumors of he possibly used shapeshifting. It disappears there and these are really good tracking dogs. In addition to this, the medicine man put a curse on the dogs, uh, on the tracking dogs for them to die. And later that day, one dog did die of heat exhaustion and then in, a few days later, another dog had ran into traffic and was killed. A police dog ran into traffic? Yes. And these were highly trained dogs. I was going to say dogs, the most highly trained dogs yeah. ran into traffic. Yeah, oh. these are like $10,000 to nope. $20,000 nope. worth dogs that are highly trained. And so... So I asked you before we went to tape if the case was solved because I thought that they had sort of solved it. And your response was, you'll see. And that was exactly correct. Mm -hmm. Because I still, as I'm sitting with you now, I still don't know, is it solved? I, I have no idea what the resolution is here. Uh, Gene, he did go back to prison when he got off because he still had to serve time for their previous sentences. Mm -hmm. And he died in prison two months later from a heart attack. So he took it with him to grave whether he really yeah. did it or not. And so it feels to me, I would say, unsolved because yes. we still don't know what happened the night yeah. of the murders. So what was your, Cassie, what was your takeaway from this when you first heard it? Basically, it made me glad that I had friends in the tent with me and we had whistles. So if something was wrong, we would blow whistles. Uh, it was really freaky. Um, 
it was something like you'd see a, like a Goosebumps kind mm -hmm. of story. Uh, yeah, it's like a true urban yeah. legend. And we I heard close. the story as well. I go camping all the time. Not anymore. Yeah, and Not when today. we camped on our tree, but we like would camp our tents close to together. Sometimes we'd even link our tents together, so we'd be all together if something like happened. And wow. It, it was just an image of him like their tent was slashed and him to be able to slash and pull the girls out of their sleeping bags out from the tent while they were sleeping. During a thunderstorm. And during a thunderstorm. And there had to have been somebody else because it was three girls. I felt like one would have got up and ran or like try to fight back. Yeah. These are eight, 10 year old girls. So they're like high energy. So we still, we, we probably loud. will never know what really happened that night. Right. Oh my gosh, guys, we want to hear from you in the comments section below. What really happened that night? What is your theory on this case? Had you heard about the Girl Scout murders before? Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and we'll see you next time on Murder with Friends. Oh,